Hi, welcome to Golang Programming on the Run. And today we are looking at section 24, part two. In section 24, we'll be talking about security. Of course, the security simplified. If you want to see the scope of what we're going to be doing in section 24, I suggest that you start with part one if you haven't seen that already. Now in part one, we talk about zeros and ones and talk about bit operation. And that was like a real review since we're going to be doing this from the ground up, I didn't want to make any assumptions about who knows binary operations or not. And so that's the place you'd want to start if you don't know binary operation. Here in section, in part two, I want to show you a simple cipher that we can build with using the XR operator that we operation that we cover in um, our operator that we covered in section in part one. Now, just in case you see me spell cipher with the I or the Y, just know how I checked in the dictionary and both are accepted. So please cut me a little bit of slack if I don't keep it consistent. All right. So what are we going to be doing here? Is we really going to be using um, binary operation on slices of bytes. Okay. And so I want to give you an illustration of what we were going to be doing before we get into the code. Um, the results is going to speak for itself. So there's no point in talking about the results. So let's imagine we have a buffer one and it has some bytes. And let's just say it had these 13 bytes. Like we're going to number them from zero to 12, of course. And can we love content from zero? And let's say I have a second buffer, buffer two with also some bytes. Now these two buffers don't have to be equal. If one of them, if they're equal, no big deal. So the intention we have our goal or task before us is to do a XR of buffer one and buffer two. And if you remember from the XR operation and binary operation, it does not matter which one comes first. Okay. So I can say buffer two XR buffer one or buffer one XR two. I still get the same answer. And hopefully you've been able to play with the binary operation in part one to see that this is through. Now, if we have this on equal size and buffer, how do we then perform operation be between them? Remember, binary operations are bitwise, but even when you have several bits, like we have seen in our example, we can still just line them up and still do it bytes at a time or whatever. So that's okay. So we can say that we'll take byte zero from buffer one and byte one, zero from buffer two and do the XR operation with them. And so we can do the same thing with byte one from buffer one and byte one from buffer two. And then of course we can continue. And eventually we would have used up all of the bytes in buffer two, because in this example that I'm showing you, buffer two is smaller, have fewer bytes than um, buffer one. Well, we still have more bytes in buffer one that we need to do the XR operation um, with. And so what we do is we simply restart with the first byte from buffer two and continue. And then again, once we exhaust that, we just restart. So if you look, this is very straightforward and simple. It's just we just apply the XR operation byte wise with the number of bytes that we have in the smallest buffer. And then when we exhaust that, we just sort of restart it. And we keep doing it until we have completed all the bytes in the longest buffer. Does that make sense? So I kind of wanted to show you this before I get into the code. In the code, I'm going to show you again, but hopefully by showing it to you multiple times and in a different way with the illustration and then with the code, maybe you might be able to piece it together just in case because the code could get kind of gnarly. Anyway, so with that said, let's jump to the code. So I am on my desktop and we are in section 24 and we finish part one zeros and ones. And so let me do this and let's say we're going to make a directory. Let's just make a directory and we'll call it part two simple XR cipher. And what I'm going to start with is by copying the example that we had from part one and we will call it exercise one. For example, let's copy that and we're going to Exercise seven, that's the last exercise we finished with in um, part one. Uh, we can see that, that's exercise seven. You might be saying, well, we have not operation. Why are we using that? Well, because not operation is a uni operation and you don't need a second buffer. 
and an or you can use a second buffer but i will leave that for you to play with i'm going to show you xr and you can simply just change the operation and see what you get all right so let's copy that example and we're going to copy it to our part two and we're going to call it example one so let's bring up our visual studio code editor and let's get going so where is our example one and if you let's just jog our memory what we're doing here and so let's just rerun this so i'm going to right click here and click run instead of building it on the command line and scroll up and so here we have the characters we have hello h-e-l-l-o this is what the binary value for h is binary value for e binary value for l of course you have to have that two times and then binary value for this is our k value and of course all these are going to be the same and then Okay, we line them up and we perform the exclusive or operation. And you can see, just to remind you, that exclusive or you get a one where you have a difference in value. So here's one and zero, we get a one. Here's one and one, so we get zero. One and one, we get zero. One and zero, we get one again. Zero and one, we get one. Again, it doesn't matter which one comes first. Here we have one and zero, we get one. And here up front, you can imagine, we, this is one and one, you get zero. But because of the leading zero, we don't show it. Now we could easily print it out by adding a zero to the printout value here. We could, for example, say something, I think like this, um, should allow us to show those values. Um, let's just try it and see. I mean, this is sort of, we don't really care, but uh, let's do this and there we go. So that, is, that shows us the leading zeros. Let me, close this off here and close this and so what i want to do is focus on just the binary operation here and so for this i'm going to write a function to encapsulate the operation that we're trying to perform so let's call this function function xor operation and we're going to say the two things that we need to perform this operation here is essentially so let's do this if i make this a function I can drag this into the function. And so what we need is this message. So we should pass that in as a parameter, but we'll call it buff just to, you know, abstract things a little bit. And so that's a byte slice and we need K, right? That's a byte. And what we should do is return a new buffer with our result, right? And so this now become buff, and we have k and we need some place to store a result we don't actually want to print it out so ideally what we should do is have some output where we put our result and we'll get back to that in a minute and we should return output return out well out needs to be a slice of bytes so the easiest thing we know that our what we're going to produce has to be the same length as the buffer we're given. So it seems to make sense that we should do something like this and say we make a slice that is the same length of the buffer we're given. Now, there are ways we could have done this. We can have just created an empty slice and just append append on it. And so now we have out. And so what we can say is when we iterate over this buffer, we don't only want the value, but we want the index i. And since we know the index i, for the input, we can use that for the output. So we can say, save this key, um, the computation of our K against um, this value V into this specific, particular location. And so that's that. And so with that said now, we can go back and we can clean up a few things. So for example, uh, let me move this up here a bit to where we initialize all our variable. And we can say that our Instead of looping over these values, I don't want to do any of that. Instead, what I'll say is I want to print out the message we have. So this is the message. And let's do percent %s and new line. And since MESG is a byte slice, let's class it back to a string. Now I know it was a string to begin with, but I don't have that save somewhere. so um in a separate string so let's do that and then what we should do is we should store 
the message that we're going to get from return from our XR operation into a variable. I'm just calling it E and C for now. I'll say XR operation is take this message and use this particular value, this one byte to um, create a new buffer. And let's now print that out. So let's do something like this. And we can call this, um, you know, encrypted message or something. And now we're going to do, since that's a byte also, we have to convert to a string and we call it ENC. Now we don't know exactly what that looks like. Now it's, it's still the same thing we're doing. We're not doing anything different than before. Now we're just treating this as string because we know that we had strings and that's it. Before we were looking at the binary value because we wanted to sort of see what was happening with the binary operations. But now we don't really care because we've validated that already. And so now let's run our code. And if we run this, let's see what we get. So here's our hello message. And it says it encrypted it. And it looks like 3 colon colon 9. Well, that's fine. We can imagine that how this colon colon um, basically is the encrypt when we apply XR of V to LL. We got that. And when we applied X um, V to H, it got, got something that when it tried to print it as a string, it doesn't show up as a string. Um, so you can change this to any value you like. You can make this A, for example, and you can rerun the code and you'll get something different. And there you go. You got just a single closing parentheses, but it doesn't really matter if the string, the, the byte that you have is printable or not. It is still, ENC still has the same length as MESG. That's important. I want you to know that and you should be convinced of it and you should probably print it out the length to just be sure, right? So length percent um, V, for example, and let's do length of ENC, right? So, you know, I'm not pulling the wool over your eye. Of course, you, that you should be convinced of that when you look at how the function is implemented. Um, so there we go. So there's some unprintable character here and they end up putting in like a new line, but just so you know, all right, it's there. So I'm going to take it out because I don't want it to mess up our output really. Um, so you should be convinced that it's the same number length. Okay. So let's now copy and paste this. Oh, let's see, where did it paste it to? Oh, don't do anything weird. VS code, so there, and let's do paste, and let's call this exercise two. And let's clean this up. I'm going to close this. Now, one of the next thing I want to do is to say, well, not at all, we have a way of changing the text. You're probably not convinced that though I really have created a cipher. So let's do this. Using our key, if you imagine that oh, this is some sort of information I want to secure, and this is my key that I've choose, chosen to secure it with, let's just call it A for now, it's just one byte. But if that's what I've chosen to secure it with, well, the output certainly looked different than what I had, right? So we're convinced that the output was different. So if I were to store that somewhere or display it somewhere, um, someplace, or somebody was able to see it, they would not get my super secret LO message. What they would really see is the parentheses or when I use V as the key, they would see three colon colon nine or something, right? So totally not, so totally something totally different. So at least I was able to do that. Here's the question. If you're gonna encrypt something, you need to be able to decrypt it, right? You have to go be able to hide it and unhide it. It's being, if you have a key for a lock, that key should both be able to lock, um, lock the door and also open the, the door, right? And so that's the purpose of a key for both locking and unlocking. Now we can argue about whether you use the same key or a different key, but in this example, we want to use the same key for locking and unlocking because we only have one key so far. And so let's do this. Let me copy this line and I'm going to call this 
encrypt two, and I'm going to use the same function to encrypt the same um, using the same key. But notice what I'm giving it. I'm giving the encrypted message, and now I can print out what ENC two is. I want you to stop and really focus on this. Imagine that here there's a line. Above here is the sender. The sender has some secret information, decides to use a key, encrypts that information, and send it over the wire or in a mail or something. The receiver at the bottom here uses the exact same function the sender used to encrypt the message and take the encrypted message and use the same key, must use the same key. And now we want to see if they were able to decrypt the message or recover the message. Notice what I'm printing out. I'm printing out ENC2, which is supposed to be a decrypted form, uh, message. So ENC2 should be equals to MSG. So let's run this and see if that's what we get. And you and behold, that's exactly what we get. We put in hello. We got out just parent, close parentheses and a bunch of unprintable character. That's why we have some new lines there and so on. But then when we use the same key, we got back hello. Now, at this point, you're probably besides yourself. You're either very excited, very confused, or both. XR has this special property that if you apply the same XR value to the output, it just toggles it the same way, so you recover the information. So try that for yourself and see. But hopefully, you're convinced that this is what we did. And you can use anything as a key. If you want, you can go back and use V or anything you like. So let's clear this. I remember when we used V, we got 3 colon 9 9. And so this is symmetric encryption because we're using the same key to encrypt and we're using the same key to decrypt. And so this is our very simple cipher. So, okay, so now we've, I said we've written a simple cipher. Let's see if it's going to work for any sort of message, right? I've changed the key. But we, can we use like a longer message, for example? And I hope you can see that our, the length of our message really had nothing to do with our key because we just sit in a loop and regards how long our message is. But we should try it anyway and see what this looks like. So let's do copy, paste. Let's do example three. And let's go here. So let's close some of these that, that. and let's clean up, close there. And so instead of just hello, let's do secret message, bang. And I'm going to use, still use my V key, but again, it doesn't really matter. So the only thing I changed was the message. And so let's run this. And now I have something here that looks real like real garbage before it didn't look like garbage it was like three colon nine but look at this this looked like real garbage but as you can see i was able to recover that message so, so if you weren't convinced before that we were encrypting things at least now you can see that though if i had this message to send and i was able to change this change it to this whoever is trying to read my message would probably not be able to tell what I'm sending unless they happen to guess my key. Now, since my key is very simple, notice it's one letter, that's easy to get. Somebody can just simply brute force it, right? Just going through the alphabet. So um, I can change the key certainly and get different values here, but it wouldn't be hard to uncover and decrypt this message. And so that's why real encryption is much more complicated than this, and you should choose better keys than what I'm doing. But at least I think hopefully you're excited and if you've never thought of this before or you've never seen it you can see how this simple binary operator the exclusive or operator gives you this very powerful capability so here's our final example so let's copy this paste it here example four let's close these guys up here, let's make sure we're working with this. Let's clear this.
and so now let's just say that we have this very long message but again we don't want to use a simple key so we instead want to use a string as a key instead of one character so maybe we want to say this is password one for example is our key and of course the train we have to convert this not to a byte but to a slice of bytes so that's now our this k becomes our key right and so k here becomes key and so that's what really what i was using before k was still key i just call it one letter and so now we just have to change our xr function a little bit to say that oh we have a key and it's a slice of bytes also now there are a couple of ways of implementing this and i'll do it the most straightforward way first but before i do that uh, let me sort of um go through the implementation so this xor function perform a bitewise operation on a byte slice buff using a second byte slice key so that's what we're doing now to understand how it works let's start off with some assumption so we're going to assume that n is equals to the length of buff and m is equals to the length of key then we can say well we have a couple of scenarios to consider in scenario one what if n is less than m basically what if the size or the number of bytes in our buffer is less than the number of bytes in our key. Well, that's not a big deal. What we could do is we doing remember we're doing this byte wise, right? So we take a byte from our buffer and a byte from our key and we do the operation on them and we keep going, 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 going. And because our buffer is smaller than our key, at some point we're gonna just exhaust our buffer. And that's fine. We haven't exhausted our key yet, but okay, no big deal. We just stop. We don't have anything else to do on that buffer. Can remember the output is always going to be the length of our buffer, regardless of what our key length is. If it's longer, whatever, who cares? The next scenario to consider or is when our buffer and our key are the same length. And again, this is very straightforward and easy. If they're same length, well, okay, byte for byte, no problem. The only scenario that seems to pose any sort of um, issue that we should consider carefully is when we have n the input buffer being longer than m but we've already addressed that we saw the, the 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 most extreme version of this when we had a buffer that was hello five characters and our key was just one character and how we just simply reused our key over and over so we can extend that to say well, if M is a buffer, right, if key is a buffer itself, and therefore M is greater than one, well, we just do byte wise for each of the two buffer. And when we finish, ex um, we exhaust our key buffer, right, we got to the last byte in our key buffer, what we do is just restart with it. Just like I showed you in the slide, how you just simply re re realign them, and you just restart and keep going until you exhaust again the primary buffer so that's all all there is to this and so in very layman's term if you want to think of it um, that way um, it's basically if you have a very long buffer like buffer here is very long and you're doing byte wise you just hear key is very much shorter just reuse key until you run out of buffer so you can see when I go to reuse my key here I didn't have um, my input buffer was I didn't have um, I run out of characters or bytes and so I didn't have to use T. I don't know if you noticed that, but um, <laughs> I sort of wanted to leave it like that to show you that oh, you don't have to worry about reusing the complete buffer of key each time you uh, reapply it. And I show you that in the slide also. So there's a very straightforward way of implementing this that, um, so let's close our documentation here. Um, there's a very straightforward way of implementing this and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the, it's I think it's the more it's more efficient, but because I'm always interested in writing cleaner code and clearer code than clever code, 
I'll re-implement it, but in a much more simpler way. So the straightforward way is to say that though we have input, it's going to be as long as our buffer. We're going to return that. Of course, we're going to iterate over it and perform this operation. Now K, well, what we can do is we can say M is equals to length of key, right? We can do that. And what we can do is we know I is going to range over each index of the buffer. So what we want to make sure is that each time we reach the end of K, we restart with zero. And there's already an operator for that, very simple operator. It's the modulus operator. So we can say, let's take I of module M. So what this does is it says, if I is zero, M is, of course, greater, let's say, we'll put a check to make sure M is greater than zero. So it's not empty buffer that we given as our key. So if M is, let's say five, five, zero modulus five is gonna be zero. So that does give us the very first byte in K. And as I increase, you know, it's one, well, guess what? That's gonna be still be zero, one, two, three, four. Once we reach I is five, and remember M is also five, so now it's equal. What happens? Well, five modulus five is zero. So it sort of resets back to, um, to um, zero. So this gives us a nice way of wrapping around um, the operation, right? So the modulus operation operator is really, really nice for that. Um, sorry. So let's start off and say, so let's start off and say, um, let's see how this operator and this helps us. Let's see how this modulus operator helps us. So let's say we had I and we had M. So I is gonna be zero, M is five, it's fixed. So the modulus operator of I module M, modulus M is gonna give us zero. And then I is one, modulus five, this is still gonna give us one. This is two, modulus five, it's gonna give us two. And three modulus five, give us three. Four modulus five is going to give us four. Now, when we try to do um, a five, I is five, modulus five, it's gonna give us zero. Why? Because the modulus operator is essentially doing a division and then returning you the remainder. So five divided by five is one, with zero remainder, whereas above here, four divided by five is zero, right? With four remainder, and that's why we get back four. And so now when we go to six divided by five, this is always gonna be five, we'll get one, why? Because six divided by five is one with one remainder. And similarly, when we do seven divided by five, it's going to be one with two remainder. And notice how this modular operation is going to be within the bounds from zero to four, and which is the valid value for our key, um, our key buffer. So this is the more concise way. If we use a pen, which is the next way I'm going to show you, um, we're going to each time wrap around, and every time we have to grow the buffer, we have to of course put that on. In, that's going to be recognized as garbage, and. Therefore, um, we have we be giving garbage collector some work. So um, let's do it this way. So this is the more straightforward way I'm writing it now. The other way is the more efficient way because you, you're not gonna give the garbage collector a lot of work and just upfront you just allocate the size you want. So this way we're gonna do var out is a slice byte. We're gonna still say that all we have M is the length of the key. And then we're gonna say we have some variable called i, which is an int. Then we're gonna say, I want to loop over v, um, the range over my buffer. So we have to do every byte in our buffer. And so once we do that, we have a byte. Now we have to do an operation. So we can say out is equals to append. Remember, out is a buffer and right now it's empty, but we can append to it. And so we wanna append to out, and we have to give out as the input. And this is where that, why it's not as efficient because as we start off here, this buffer is empty. The first time we call this, 
Go is going to allocate a buffer of some size for us, or some byte slice. And if we need to use more than what Go allocated, it's going to double the size of the buffer. But then that old buffer now um, had to be discarded. And so that's where the creating memory um, garbage come from. And if you're creating garbage, it has to be cleaned up. And your garbage collector is going to run. And if you're doing this often, you're calling this often in your code, or the buffer you're encoding is very large, you're creating more garbage, and your program is going to take that hit. So anyway, so we do key, and here is I. And we um, do the operation here with V. So, so far, pretty straightforward, right? Which is I. I is an index into our key. But at first, we know I is equal to zero when we come into this for loop. So that's why we can safely say K of I. But then we must check after we finish an operation. Now we need to move on to the, the next time to this loop, V is going to point to the very next byte and buff. So we have to do some housekeeping. First of all, we have to increment I so that we can point to the very next um, byte in I. But if we do that, we don't want to increment past, past the end of um, key. So we have to check and see if I is equals to M, right? If we are at the end of it after we finish an operation, let's say M here was five again in my example, and this is four. Now we increment I, I is going to be five. So if I is equal to five and it's equal to the length of the buffer, then we pass where we're supposed to be. So we need to reset I to be equals to zero. And so this is a slightly more straightforward way of implementing it, but I'm not going to repeat myself. <laughs> All right. So now when we have this, we shouldn't have any error in our code. So let's go back up and we still have the same message. Now, the only thing that's different is that our key is also a slice of bytes. And of course, we talk about the whole, they can be different length or anything like that. So now let's see how our code, um, our message changes. So if we run this, and hmm, that doesn't seem to work. But more interestingly is I should expect two encrypted message and I'm only seeing one. So that tells me that my program somehow exited prematurely. Like we never got to this point. So this is the encrypted message and this is supposed to say decrypted. Uh, let's change that. D-C-R-Y-P-D, decrypted, right? Or original message, something like that. Um, and I'm not seeing that. Um, let's see, why is that there? Um, let's do run again. And yep. It start printing out something and it looks like it's exiting. So um, I don't know if there's something in the message itself that is causing the program to exit. Um, let's do this. Um, I'll do, 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 do. Um, let's um, not print this out and simply try to print out the decrypted message and see if there's something in the characters that are in that encrypted output that it's causing the program to exit. And there we go. There is some some sort of when we encrypt our message, there's a character that we're trying to print out that is resulting in our program exiting. I don't know what that character is, but notice simply by commenting out this line, we are able to get our second message. So there's something in that character that's in the message that's that's doing it. So if you've seen anything funny like that, just try not printing out that decrypted character, right? It could be a signaling character, like I show you the ASCII table, there might be something in there that's signaling exit. So don't freak out if your code doesn't work, just don't print out the decrypted one. If you still really wanna see the decrypted um, message, maybe what you can do is write it out to a file instead so um, just in case writing it to the screen is causing a problem. So for example, we can say, you know, F colon equals to OS dot open um, this file, or I think it's create, sorry, not open. Create a file called, I don't know, encrypted.txt. And we know it's how we have to get, when we do that, we're gonna get an error also. So then we say if, you know, well, let's just ignore errors for now because we're just trying to show that we have encrypted data. So then we can say, um, you know, uh, 
f that right and that takes a buffer and our buffer is the encrypted text that we have there and then we can say um, f that close and that's it and so we write our encrypted data to this file and so now let's run it and we should have a new file called encrypted.txt or maybe encrypted.bin and this is saying that oh, there's a binary file do you want to see it anyway I can say open and there you go so this is what it looks like our encrypted file again doesn't look anything like our message but that's what it looked like so we saw the dollar sign being printed and then afterwards um, something else caused the program to exit so there's our results to prove that we encrypted it and notice we're using a key and so you can try different keys and you can see what I look like so let me um, rename this file so I'll call it encrypt one a txt and let's do this um, change the key to secret one and let's load it to save I rerun it I should have another file called encrypt.txt and it's the same message I did not change the message I go look and notice what this looks like something very different no is with this set of buffer is it um bytes encrypted byte is it going to cause the program to exit i don't know we could undo that line rerun it and see if it ex causes the line to exit the program to exit and it does um we don't see our encrypted or decrypted output so something in it um is causing it to um thing and this is not going to happen for all your messages just i just want to show you that it could happen for some of them and so don't worry about trying to if you try to print it out and it doesn't print, just write it out to a file like this and then you can verify it in the file and you can see what, what it looks like. All right, so that's it. Um, I hope you, when I saw this the first time, I was like, whoa, this is super cool. So this is our simple cipher. Um, it's really simple, but at least it demonstrates how we can um, change the text to look pretty crazy and then still recover it using the same key and that is known as symmetric encryption all right take care see you in the next video and certainly let me know if you have questions or comments and if you like what you're seeing please 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 subscribe if you are watching this and you haven't subscribed thumbs up the video um check the bell icon so that you can know when i post videos and certainly spread the word i'd love to have more people come and see what we're doing here and what you're liking all right, bye. Have a great day.